Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to um, to to do the the introductions um, in a, a very succinct way. Um, we have uh, four panelists today. Um, Brianna Stigger is our um, student representative. She is um, a student doc student in the HESA program and is completing her dissertation on racial battle fatigue, which is very exciting. Um, she has a long history of work with uh, social justice and is gonna talk with us uh, about her experiences. Uh, Dr. Ana Paula Correa is um, uh, the director of SEAT, the Center for, um, oh goodness, um, the Center for, I have it, for, for. It's okay, Colette. Is a center on education uh, on education training for employment. It took me oh. a long time to figure it out too, but we go by seat as a nickname. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, and her research also um, involves um, uh, an understanding of the social justice issues within education and training. Um, Dusty Miller, uh, Dr. Dustin Miller, is um, a faculty person in. Uh, educational leadership, and he has experience in the field as an educational leader um, and also has experience with a uh, diverse identity himself. And uh, we've asked him to come and speak about um, how do you maintain wellness while also dealing with um, all of the uh, oppressive systems in the world. And, and then our moderator is Dr. Tanya Middleton, um, who is a, a clinical professor for um, counselor education, and as a professor, she uh, focuses on mental health and wellness, uh, and her research also involves um, understanding oppressive cycles and systems within um, the society as a whole. Um, so welcome, everyone, for um, this diversity lecture series presentation, and Tanya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Colette. I appreciate that. Um, can y'all hear me? Okay. Good afternoon. I thank everybody for joining us today. Um, as Colette mentioned, this is a very important topic for us to be able to discuss. Not only am I a professor, but I'm also a licensed counselor. And, you know, one of the things that I always encourage my clients to do that I don't do as well is to really just take a moment and reflect on everything that we are experiencing, everything that we're, you know, kind of living um, in our day to day. Um, as we know, you turn on the news, you're hearing so much about the oppression that's in society right now. I mean, you're hearing about the police brutality and the murders. We're hearing about the killings of LGBTQ plus, you know, members in the community. Um, all of these school shootings, just random acts of violence. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask us to just take a second to just really just pause and take a couple of deep breaths and really just reflect on some of the things that we've seen because it does impact us. And if you haven't done that, then I'm encourage you to do it now. Um, so just everybody just take a moment and just, just take a couple deep breaths and reflection of what we've kind of been dealing with over the last couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, it's a lot. It's heavy. Our work is heavy. Our lives are heavy. But, you know, we, we always have to encourage wellness, no matter what in what capacity that we're working in. Um, but I do want to take a moment for us to just talk to our panelists a little bit, and you all can go in any order that you see fit, or I can call you out. Um, but tell us a little bit about who you are. We, we know what you do, kind of, but who are you? And and why is it important for you to be on this panel and just kind of speak to some of the social issues um, that you, you know, advocate for um, within your own lives of work, even if it's in your personal life as well? I can call out Dusty because um, I like him so much. He's one of my favorites, so it's good to work with him again. <laughs> well, that didn't work in my favor because I got called out first. So, no, I uh, as as Colette said, and 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 thank you, Tanya, for that that nice uh, intro. Um, I I spend our my days now helping to train our next generation of school principals uh, and superintendents uh, to a certain degree. So I think that a lot of what we've already opened with is important to me because these jobs are not getting any easier. 
I continue to feel that most educators approach their work with an open heart and wanting to do good, even if they are misguided, they're not doing it intentionally, you know, and they want to get better, but it's just become uh, really, really hard. And then they, they think they're making good decisions and they, and they make not. So I find myself focusing more on them as most educators do put the oxygen mask on yourself after you've lost your breath usually. Um, and so uh, I think I, I work really hard to try to keep that in focus. And as Donna said, like no pain, no gain. But I found, especially when I was a leader, I was afraid a lot, you know, because I was, I was, I'm politically savvy enough to know how to keep my bosses happy. But there are times when you have to do what is right. And I was, I didn't realize it at the time, but in reflection, I was scared to make waves. It was my job to keep things calm and, and moving forward. But in doing that, you're maybe not protecting people who need protection the most. So I think in my own life, it's trying to recenter like, okay, I'm going to be courageous today. And then when I'm in tears by 9, 15 a.m., it didn't go well, but I'm going to regroup. And I'm going to do it better by 10 a.m. Uh, you know, but just but just realizing that it's hard and that we're all vulnerable and it's OK to be scared uh, and frightened about the political culture that's around you. But but we have to be strong. And that's where people like you guys, as my colleagues, serve as a, um, you know, as a as a source of um, of strength, because I know at three in the morning, if things go really sideways, Donna Ford's going to be in her car on in route coming in hot <laughs> and you guys would as well. So I think that's just kind of having a positive attitude um, about, about the difficulty works well for me. Thank you. Thank you, Dusty. Um, Anna, go ahead. Anna Paula, if you would like to. Hello everyone. Uh, when uh, first, let me thank you. Uh, you, Tanya, and Colette for inviting me to this panel. I kind of debate initially if I should accept or not. Colette knows about my hesitation. But then I said that I'll, I'll be accepting the invitation, not because I do specific work or research in social justice and equity issues like many of you do, but because... I have more responsibility now that I'm not only a teacher, but also the leader of a center that uh, carries on activities on uh, groups of people that have been historically misrepresented or underrepresented. So I've been educating myself with the, the help of many people around SEAT to become a more uh, inclusive and ec racial equity, uh, equitable leader. Also looking back to my career as a teacher and as professor, I feel that I've been using some kind of a platform, you know, I think we as professors and teachers have a platform and responsibilities towards our students and learners to, uh, to model being fair and just. So far, I've been living in three continents, and I don't think I will move to a fourth one. But um, looking back to my schooling experience and to my career as a teacher that started many years ago as a science teacher, I taught secondary school um, biology and geology in two high school students in Portugal. I identify myself as a Portuguese American, and it's... I'm still learning about race and equity, inclusion, and diversity in the United States, even though I've been here for so many years now. It's a nonstop learning. And I guess I'm just excited to be here and can't, can't wait to learn more from all of you, including Dustin and Brianna, you know, because I'm in this learning path and I want to know more and do better. Thank you for your honesty with that. Um, definitely powerful to even admit that we all we all have growing to do. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Brianna. 
Thank you, Dr. Middleton, and thank you, Dr. Mills and Dr. Dollarhide for allowing me to be here today. I'm really excited to be a part of this panel and just honored to um, share and participate and share my story and hopefully encourage and inspire and empower all of you on this, what seems like daunting and sometimes never-ending journey for racial and social justice. Um, so my name is Brianna, but I go by Brie. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am just passionate about um, being a voice for the the voiceless. I am passionate about advocating for Black women specifically. Um, for a long time, I was born and raised in Newark, Ohio, so it's about 45 minutes from here, predominantly white town. Um, I did not have, K through 12, I did not have a professor who looked like me. Uh, the only thing that I learned about my people was that, you know, they're from Africa and they're poor and they're dirty. Um, I didn't have any representation. Um, I didn't have an understanding of my own history, culture. I didn't have anyone who looked like me to even talk to about it. And then when I went to college and I started, you know, learning about my own history, my own culture, the African diaspora, and just how um, race and, and racism played a part in my life, how I really fit the norm of the stereotypical angry Black woman, right, or the, the token <laughs> Black woman, or any of these things that people would um, say to me or about me, I would accept them. I, I had a lot of... Um, internalized racism that I had to really work on unlearning. A big part of this is learning, but a lot of it is unlearning. And uh, I, I have really, over these past few years, I have stepped into my power. I have stepped into my purpose. I am unapologetically unapologetically Black, unapologetically woman, unapologetically a Christian, and I am proud of all of those identities. Um, and those are really what fuels my faith. Um, and I, I really like the term putting faith to action. Um, and, and that is how I get by. That is how I continue. That is how I carry on. I'm working to create a legacy for my family, for the future generations, um, and for everyone that is inspired and empowered by this journey. So I think it's just important um, um, oh, hi, Dr. Beard. Nice to see you. Uh, and, and I worked in EAG before, so it's nice to see my, my family. Um, I'm in the College of Engineering now as the Program Manager for Inclusive Excellence. And over the past several years, um, I have been heavily involved in activism, um, starting with Brianna Taylor. So March 13th of 2020 really changed my life. And that was a pivotal moment um, where I actually went, I was working in the College of Social Work at the time. I went downtown with several of my students and and um, we were actually tear gassed. I don't know if you remember um, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty being on the news. Like we were about 50 feet from her. So we were all there and they shot us with these huge rubber bullets and we were tear gassed. And my only weapon was a poster that literally said justice for Breonna Taylor. Um, and being in a crowd of thousands of people who were peaceful at the time, let me add that, um, who were screaming your name, it, it's a different it hits different, right? It's a different feeling. It's a different atmosphere when um, it it makes it real that it's you and that these injustices are happening. So I actually went, um, I reached out to, first of all, I reactivated the NAACP. I, I moved back to my hometown, back to Newark. I was still working here in Columbus. So I did that hour drive uh, one way each day. Uh, so I'm sure you can appreciate that. But I felt called. I felt that God was calling me into my purpose and to go back and to, to serve my people and to help my people. So while I was serving as the president of the NAACP, I reached out to Miss um, Tamika Palmer, that is Brianna Taylor's mother. And I just asked her, I, I literally slid into her DMs and Insta on Instagram and I said, is there any way, you know, that I that I can come and, and support and help? And she said, actually, we're having a rally this weekend. And I was able to go there and meet Tiffany D. Lofton, um, Tamika Mallory, so many of my idols and, and the, the women, the Black women that I look up to and I'm so inspired by. Um, and I was able to meet, most importantly, Breonna Taylor's mother. And that really just, it changed my life. It, it changed my life. And to be there to, to witness, um, they call it Injustice Square. Um, and they they actually have renamed it now Brie Way, um, which I, I really love. And her favorite color, Brianna Taylor's favorite color, is purple, just like mine. And she was just three years younger um, than than me. So to me, she she is me. I am her, and and she is my sister. And I will always uplift and affirm um, her name. And she is the very reason why I have decided to focus on racial battle fatigue um, for my dissertation. So my research is um, focused on Black female student activists navigating 
navigating with racial battle fatigue here at the university. And I'm honored to have two of my amazing professors, Dr. Mills and Dr. Ford here, um, who have both supported me and inspired me on this journey. And it always, it hasn't always been easy, but I appreciate them specifically for the support and encouragement and reaching out. Um, and then I did, I, I would be remiss if I did not share and uplift the other name um, of, of my, my dear friend that I've been supporting, and that is Julius Jones. Um, Julius Jones has been incarcerated um, on death row for the past 23 years for a crime that he did not commit in Oklahoma. He he was a young Black man, um, and he was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. He was, there, there's a whole a whole podcast about it. I'm happy to share information if you're wanting to, to see it. But long story short, he was a victim of the injustice system is what I call it. And so um, Julius, I, I heard about Julius through my work with Brianna Taylor's family. And I saw the, the hashtag justice for Julius. So I inquired to see what it was about. Um, I watched the documentary by Viola Davis, uh, which was phenomenal. And it really changed my life once again. And I felt called to reach out. So I reached out to Julius's family. I went to Oklahoma two years ago now um, in summer of 2021 um, to actually attend the third and final parole board hearing. So this was going to make the decision of if he's living or if he's going to be executed. Um, and by the grace of God, he was spared from execution. Um, so we were extremely grateful. Um, but it's it, it's a long road and it's a very daunting and, and tedious situation because he is still incarcerated uh, today for a crime that he did not commit. Um, so he was not executed, but he is not free yet. Um, and the governor, just the, the way in which the governor navigated was very frustrating and alarming to me and really just disheartening that one person has all this power. Um, but he had already, we had spoken to Julius um, November 18th of 2022 is when Julius was supposed to be executed. We spoke to him for the last time. Um, his head was shaved. He had his last meal. He had his last contact with his family. Um, and we we thought that was it. Like we would never see him again. Um, and we literally get a call three hours before um, he was supposed to be executed saying that the governor issued a stay of execution, which means he won't be executed. But instead of serving um, death, he had a death sentence. So he was on death row. Now he's serving life without the possibility of parole. So now we're literally to this day trying to fight for him. Um, I just spoke to him a few weeks ago and he's okay. Um, but he, He's maintaining as, as best as he can, but he appreciates all the, the love and support that everyone has given to him. Um, but we, we just have to fight. I, I just believe that we have to fight. We have to continue fighting for justice, for our people, for liberation, for, for freedom. And, and as I was saying to a colleague, yesterday. We just want to live. We just want to live. We just want to breathe. We just want to be here in our Black body. I want my children that I don't have yet to know that they are safe. They are loved. They are affirmed. And they are in a world that loves them. Um, and I'm working hard. I'm, I'm working really hard to create that world. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna, for, for those powerful words there. Um, I, I don't know how I can follow any of that up, but uh... Thank you. You know, it's just definitely and what I what I'm hearing from you is um, a passion that feels our purpose. You know, and I think even Anna and Dusty spoke to this too. Um, things that are passionate that we feel passionate about are things that kind of propel you know our fire to um, to act. And we heard some wonderful things from you. Um, I'm wondering for Dusty and Anna, can you all speak to you know your drive and some of the issues that you are um, particularly passionate about um, and what you've kind of done as far as involvement on any level. Um, with your work or even, you know, like I said, personally um, or even for professional use. Go ahead, Dustin. I was gonna to defer to you, but thank you, Anna Paula. Uh, I think what I'm passionate about is the continued focus for representation, especially in K-12 environments. Um, you know, I think that we've come a long way when you look at curriculum, et cetera, but I think that we have to continue to press on, you know, every, every student, frankly, teacher, you know, needs to see themselves. Um, and I, and I think that, uh, Bree had touched on that in, in being a student at Newark, you know, and so we have to move beyond that in my little particular corner of the world. It's a little interesting because as a queer person, you don't always know if your teacher, maybe 
you know, uh, a, you know, family to you, for lack of a better term. And there are some, what I like to just say, comical stereotypes that we try to apply. Uh, but, you know, that's a dangerous game to get into uh, as well. So, you know, how do we continue to make sure that in, in my world, again, if, if I am a uh, member of the LGBTQ community, uh, as a student growing up, do I see safe places? Um, and that doesn't mean that allies are not. I think we all know that. Uh, but how do we continue that press on on representation and helping people figure out a way to do it um, that is appropriate, uh, et cetera, in K-12 is where is where I like to keep my focus, at least currently. Oh, by the way, also forgot one other thing <laughs> uh, that there is. I When I was a high school principal, um, it, again, you kind of feel alone. You know, I don't necessarily know how many queer uh, principals are around Central Ohio. I know some and I can make some assumptions, but uh, I contacted our National Association and said, look, can we start just some sort of a group? And again, quote unquote, it's hard to get the message out. And so uh, the NAS or uh, the National Association of Secondary School Principals, NASSP, was more than gracious. And we now have 250 uh, queer school leaders who get together once a month on Zoom uh, and it's just been it's been a really nice opportunity to bring that group together just to be just to feel safe uh, for a few minutes in their day. So those are my two areas right now that are important. Thank you. Uh, I, Tanya, and I, everyone, I'm, I don't remember if I understand or if I remember the entire question, but here I go. So just stay with me for a moment. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit of a story. You all experienced, it was June 2020, right after George Floyd's assassination in the middle of racial and social outcry on top of grappling with the, the global health crisis that put us all in lockdown. Not only like we as faculty members, as teachers, as students, as staff members that work in research centers like SEED, had to quickly adapt to remote work, but as importantly, we had to support and to engage with what was happening in the world. So I'm talking about June 2020 specifically because for me it was a, a turning point for me as a scholar. So I think I became a, a scholar activist on that time, that time period. Maybe I will, I was before, but that was very, it's very clear to me. So thanks to our fierce leader, SIT Associate Director, Melissa Ross on the steering committee, we not only uh, make sense of what was going on at, during that summer, but also put a call for action. And we start the racial equity, diversity and inclusion movement. And I know Melissa is here and Tracy too, and other members of the steering committee. I, I cannot mention everyone because I'm afraid to leave anyone out and I don't want that. And that's my uh, intensive learning journey start there. We also have our faculty associates at SEED. We have the Dr. Belinda Gilbert. I know she's part of that journey as well. And what I guess, I think Tani asked, what is our passion? I think as Donna Ford mentions many times, it's not about equality, it's about equi equity. Did I represent this well, Donna? So I want to live in a world that is equitable, particularly in the educational technology field that tends to be um, a place where there's no representation, uh, not only, uh, not many representation in terms of gender, orientation, race, ethnicity, nationality, maybe. But also, so I, I guess my passion is to make the field of learning of education technology more equitable, as Don has been has been teaching me what that word equitable world means. Maybe not entire world, but at least on the people that I touch, not only at seat, but also with my students that come across, they come from all walks of life as well as all points in the world, any, all places in the world, and they bring their own experiences. And when they arrive to a different country, like the United States, I'm particularly speaking about the international scholars and international students, there's much to make sense of. 
And as Tania starts this conversation today with a pause and a moment of silence for all the mass shootings that are happening around us, targeting underrepresented groups. So I know it's a side note, but when I call my parents, they ask me, can you go to the supermarket safely? Because they think we need to go undercover to the supermarket to get groceries because they hear every day about deaths and shoots, uh, shootings and deaths in, in the US, in particular in the Midwestern area, because they know I'm living in Ohio. I guess that kind of my clumsy answer to your question, Tanya. <laughs> but there's passion for sure. And I'm learning, as I mentioned before. Thank you all for helping me on this learning journey. Not clumsy at all. I think just <laughs> speaking from your heart, and that's really what drives our passion, right? Um, and as all of you are talking, you know, just about your quest for these equitable conditions, whether it's in the schools and in leadership and in the community, you know, and, and working with the various demographics that we work with, you know, it's almost like we're fighting this bad, this never ending battle. Like, when is it ever going to to end or is there an end game here or, or what else can we do? You know, we're seeing some situations where there are immediate, you know, um, resolve and then others that just continue to permeate and even get worse to that degree. So I'm kind of curious in the work that you all are doing, how do you manage or do you, <laughs> the famous word, do you manage with um, this carrying this heavy load? You know, what are some things that you currently are doing or that you have tried in the past to really manage, you know, your own um, mental health um, and just stability um, when it comes to this type of work? I'm happy to start um, and, and I'll be candid and, and honest with y'all here, um, last week was a, a really hard week for me. It was a really, really challenging week for me. Um, I want to give a shout out to my supervisor. She's here, uh, the Chief Diversity Officer in the College of Engineering, Ms. Lisa Barclay. Um, and it's so great to have the support of my supervisors, my colleagues, my mentors, um, who a, a lot of them are Black women, um, because there's just an understanding, right? I don't have to come to you and tell you why I have to have my Zoom camera off, because you understand, because you feel that same fatigue and exhaustion that I do, and you support me when I'm crying, you support me when I'm raging, you support me when I'm numb, and I don't have the words to say. So um, I, I think a huge shout out to my community, just many of you here who support me, who check in, who encourage, who, you know, who, who really are, are the the fuel behind the work that I do, um, because I couldn't do it without you. So it it takes community. Um, number one, number two, I'll say my faith. My faith in God is is very very important, and it's a pillar. I have to. Um, last week was so hard for me, and. The, the reason why I'm sharing that is because Tyree Nichols was born June 5th, 1993, the same exact day of Breonna Taylor. So just knowing that the, the re-traumatization, um, you know, after talking to Breonna Taylor's mom and and hearing her heart break all over again, because not only was her baby taken away, but another young Black baby was taken away with the same birth date um, as her very own daughter. So uh, at the hands of white supremacy. And so just, I... I to be honest with y'all, I, I I had a horrible week. I I lost it. I, I did not know. I was I was crying. I couldn't sleep. I wasn't taking care of myself. Um, I I'm working. This is my position, right? Program manager for inclusive excellence. This is my dissertation, right? Focusing on racial battle fatigue. It's my job. I'm still getting I'm still getting calls, you know, from people in the local community, both Newark and Columbus, that I serve that that are wanting, that are needing things. That you know, there was a 13 year old baby girl, um, who attempted suicide at Lakewood Middle School because she was called the N-word by four white boys. And so I, I'm trying to navigate all of this. I'm trying to to still breathe myself while navigating in this Black body, um, while having, you know, a, a partner who is a Black man, a brother who is a Black man. Um, you know, all of the, the people, many of the people that I love share the marginalized identities that I do. So not having any sort of reprieve, being afraid to even, to your point, Anna, like going to the grocery store going to the even when when Brianna Taylor was murdered I couldn't sleep for weeks like I 
I mean, knowing that someone can bust into my house right now and literally shoot me for no reason, right? Because of my identity. I, 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 I couldn't really grasp that. And so um, the, the ways in which I, I have had to navigate that um, are, are sometimes just really tuning it out, like tuning out the media. So I, I have been off of social media. I take frequent social media breaks and I, I highly suggest all of you to do that as well. Um, I am very strong in my faith. So even though I'm not, I haven't been going to church in person as much as I could and should, um, I have been, you know, praying. I actually have a war room, a prayer room in my home um, where I pray frequently. Um, I have, you know, a community of, of prayer warriors all across the world. Um, we have actually created, it's called the Justice Church um, through the, the people who were advocating for Julius, we have now created a, a virtual church and we meet literally every Tuesday, um, every Tuesday evening. We've been doing this for years now. So it's just important to be in community, to have people who you're, you can be surrounded by, who you can be yourself with, right? I can come to you as I am. Um, when things happen, people are working to, to support you, to check in on you, um, and just giving you the space and grace to heal. As Black people, specifically, we don't have the space and grace to heal because I'm still trying to get over Tyree, but next week, we're going to see in the headlines another project issue, right, right. you know, that right. uh, another thing that is happening. So um, I think it's just important to keep our minds clear. Um, I also follow and, and listen to a lot of podcasts from um, Black yeah, Therapy. Yeah. yeah. I don't mean to cut you right there, yeah. but I want to make sure we leave time for it. So oh, like, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. You're passionate, girl. I hear you. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got a lot. You need to write a book on all that, but uh, I appreciate you. Um, now you, you don't give Anna Paul and Dustin anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right um but i appreciate you though because it's a lot i mean it's so heavy right now it is a lot um dusty and, and anna paula how about you all what are some things that you do to um essentially um you know remain well and, and some mental health practices of your own that you may or may not do so dusty is that, is that okay if i will go first now yes absolutely thank you it's i i think Everyone is to try new, new new practices, new strategies. I really appreciate Brianna being so generous on her practices and her strategies. is It's not going to be the same for everybody, but I kind of encourage everyone to try new things. For me, the most important thing, or not the most important thing, but the main strategy that I use is introspection and self-knowledge because it kind of helps me to, during high stress, times of high stress and anxiety that has been nonstop, like we don't have a break. So I try to go back to what, what are my values? Like what do I value throughout my life here on earth? And for me is health, family, and nourishment of body and soul. I know job is somewhere there, work is somewhere there, but if these things are not in place, you know, you know family is about love and, and nourishment is about being good to your body and to your spirit and to your men, uh, mental I said brain. <laughs> and health, like without health, then nothing is going to happen, right? We just, you know, the only unsolvable problem is death because there's no escape to that. So I'm trying to ground on these three values that kind of, that, you know, they've been changed throughout my life. They change, my value changes as I engage in this self-discovery journey that will end the day of my death. And it's okay for me to uh, talk about death because it's part of our life here in, in this planet. Uh, talking about the planet, one thing that really helps me is to is to connect with nature. That's why I picked this background today, because I wanted to connect to what I value the most. Maybe because I study biology and geology and I was a science teacher. I don't know why, but when I'm in, in a high stress moment of my day, I go for a walk, a walk. And if the weather does not allow it, because I don't like cold weather, I just go outside to my backyard for a few minutes, just breathing the cold air and looking at the birds and, you know, looking at the trees and the leaves and the grass kind of help 
nature put everything into perspective and helps us to set back and view the problems from a different light, one that is not as threatening. So I guess this is my strategy. It also helps me support my mindfulness by being aware of my surroundings in my backyard and the wonders of other living beings and the clear understand that humans are not only living beings on earth. <laughs> so that sense of being present in the moment, I know it's not going to solve the problems of the world and the trauma and the sadness we're going through, but at least it's going to help me clear my mind so I can do the best I can as I engage with action. That's kind of my strategy. You know, there's more uh, meditation and um, community, but for me, nature is, is the main source of presenter. I appreciate that, connecting it back to, to the roots of everything. It's good. And yes. What about you, Dusty? What are you, some things that you may practice or do? Yeah, I think we've already heard, you know, some some really good good things, and I would I would complement that by saying that um, for me, I, I we talked about community, and you know, you need people around you, and there are several people on this call that I could, you know, tell different stories about grabbing coffee on a Sunday afternoon or whatever the case is. So I think having good people around you, as Brie also, you know, echoed that uh, that's helpful. Uh, I'm a strong believer in that we move in the direction of our thoughts. Uh, you know, part of my own dissertation was. Uh, based on appreciative inquiry. And I know that's not always applicable and there's a lot of factors in that, but I try in those moments when I'm finding myself losing my grip or as my 93 year old grandmother says, dropping her basket, um, you know, that I try to, you know, reel that back and, and remind myself of, okay, what's, what's the case? What's going on here? Um, I also uh, use humor, which that's not always a good thing. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm not the best person to be in line at a funeral uh, home with sometimes, uh, but I do like humor. I think that uh, lifts people up. And if you can get people laughing, it doesn't matter usually how how negative the situation is. At least we're taking a moment to to distract ourselves. And so I try to find humor uh, as much as I can in my own behavior, as well as um, that in the people around me. And then the last thing is I really try to prioritize being around um, or in school environments. I mean, obviously we have a big one here at OSU, uh, but I started my morning out today at 7.15 talking to a group of middle school teachers. Uh, and there's just an energy when you're in a school environment that kind of brings us, brings me back into focus that I, you know, um, that this is why we do this job and we're going to have hard days. But when you watch kids going down a hall or frankly, even just a group of teachers uh, you know, chatting and, and, and having fun together, it, it, it makes it all, uh, makes it all worthwhile. Thank you all for that. Um, definitely. I'm taking notes with what everyone is saying about community and nature and really just humor. Dusty, I read my SEIs. I try to use it all the time. Sometimes I fall flat, but um, it's a part of my own coping anyway, but, um, these are really good strategies to think about. And, and again, when we do this type of work, I think it's so, important that we begin to focus and do, you know, interpersonal work on ourselves. We think about advocacy. We're so quick to advocate for other people and other causes, but we forget the main component of that is, are we okay? You know, uh, a lot of times when people ask me questions, you know, how are you? How are you doing, Tanya? And I was like, oh, I'm good. But anyway, let me tell you about class. Let me tell you about work. Let me tell you about these stressors. But, but I'm not talking about myself. You know, and so what I'm doing is suppressing a lot of those emotions and those feelings. I'm not really dealing with them because I'm just piling on some other issues that I feel like I need to be fighting for or working, you know, for. Um, my next question to you all is, have you ever, you know, ran into a situation where you felt like, you know what, I am overwhelmed. All this is a bit much for me and how, you know, essentially I, I need to reset. And I need to really, truly prioritize my own self-care because I'm carrying around all this work. I mean, you know, Brianna, you mentioned so many different levels of activity that you're involved in, but do you have a reset button and, and what does that look like? And, and, you know, do you know what that even looks like where you just need to just, you know what, I just need to take a, a step back. And so can you just briefly tell us about your reset button and, and what that looks like for you? Yes. Um, for me, 
my reset button is one word and it's travel. I love to travel. Um, I just got back from Jamaica a few, uh, I guess, weeks or a couple months ago now, um, celebrating my mother's retirement. I, I believe that there's so much world that we need to see and just traveling allows me to, um, exactly what you said, Anna Paula, experience things, right? I, I went to Italy. I studied abroad in Italy. It was my first flight um, when I was an undergrad and that changed my life. And so since then, I, I love traveling. Um, some of my favorite places are Cuba, Colombia, um, Cartagena was beautiful, um, just got back from Jamaica. So any chance I can get to travel to the Bahamas, um, I love the beach. There's something about the water that is very spiritual and calming for me. Um, I just have this affinity to water. Fun fact, I don't know how to swim, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm six feet tall. So I just get in there and just roll around and watch the waves and, and just find my peace there. So um, we have to focus on Black joy. We have to focus on those moments to be still um, and, and to still trust God despite what it looks like. So I'll, I'll stop there because I can really go on. But uh, yes, travel for me is is the way that I reset. Um, and I need to think about something to do for graduation coming up here soon. Thank you for that. Yay. That's close to being Dr. Steyer. Appreciate that. Okay, reset button for you. Or or let me rephrase that question um, for Dusty. And how do you know when you need a reset? Are there warning signs or or anything for you? Like my my, you know, in a car when you see all the lights starting to go on, what's what's your do you know your warning signs yet? Is it all right if I go, Anna Paula? Yeah. Uh so warn I think for me, I start to blow things out of proportion in my head. You know, there's not a conspiracy theory like, you know, <laughs> light enough. And I notice when I start to do that, when I'm thinking about every worst possible case scenario that could happen, that's my trigger. Uh, and that also waking up at 3 a.m. I don't know why it's always 3 a.m., but for some reason, if I'm waking up at 3 a.m., which happens a lot less now than it used to be when I was a building principal, so that's a good thing. But I know that I'm starting to lose my grip. You know, that if I if or if something minor happens, like just an email from a colleague sets me into uh, this happened, this happened. Why did this happen? You know, I know I just have to quiet, stop, relax um, uh, and, and set that down. So those are I, I, when I when I, I notice that, you know, in myself and I try really hard to. Uh, the other thing, and we actually talk about this in class is um, when a loved one of yours says, hey, I didn't send the email. You know, and so when you see that, you know, all of a sudden you look at your phone or you like, and you're distracted now and your loved ones know that, you know, so I also listen to my partner. I listen to my, I, my dad is my best friend, like, and he can read me for miles away. So I try to listen, um, you know, to that. Uh, and, and when I'm, when I'm not being as in tuned uh, or starting to, to lose that. Um, but I think as far as the reset, Am I allowed to say drinking heavily? Is that not appropriate? No. <laughs> so I one of my colleagues, one of my colleagues on this call, which I won't call her out. Uh, I think we have an annual check in before. <laughs> Is it time for happy hour? Let's roll. Uh, so no, I think that. Uh, but again, that that's a uh, there's community in that. There's a little bit of again humor coming out. But um, I think uh, this work can go on for a long, long time, and it's wonderful. And we all wouldn't do this job if we didn't love it. But you do have to stop and, and press that reset. Uh, in travel for you, you're right on good travel spot. Appreciate that, Dusty. And so you and your other unnamed colleague know I'm also licensed in chemical dependency. So if you're <laughs> so perfect, as long as oh, I can drink while I'm on your couch, I am in there. I will do it. No, no, we didn't say we got we got to manage it. We'll talk about it. Okay, all right. <laughs> but you know, no, you're absolutely right, and I appreciate your honesty there because that is a a bigger deal too, even with us, we do turn to like substances to kind of cope and deal with different things. As long as it's not an excess, you do what you need to do. Go to happy hour, just invite me. Um, okay, Anna Paula, what about you? I'm just going to build on, on what Brianna and Justin said. Travel is, uh, I c it's for me, it's, I cannot live without traveling. I will be miserable and probably die if I cannot go out and explore other places. I do have affinity to water too, Brianna, but I don't know how to swim. <laughs> so every time we have like an outside uh, a retreat or outside event, outside the seat building, I always ask, we need to go to a place close to the water. <laughs> so everyone knows already, we need to find a venue close to the water because we need that water energy. And um, okay, about the drinking part. 
I do like to drink tea and make my own teas, my only like with roots and and uh, herbs. So I, I like to try with teas. Don't have much to learn about it. Something that I recent got interested because it again it kind of resets me and and it nourish my body. That's part of my value. Something that nourish my body and and the soul. But one thing I'm going and this is going to be a total um, let's say disclosure. One thing that really resets me is a nap. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> so when I'm overwhelmed and my signs of overwhelmness is I start making mistakes, dropping things, burning things in the oven, leaving the garage without pushing the doors up, you know, I know I need to stop. Okay, I make all these mistakes. My family's already used to it because things show up broken at home. They know it's me. So I need to reset. And taking a power nap is the best for me. And again, we are all different. And then when I wake up from my nap, I go back to work like if it's 9 a.m. And my coworkers start getting all these emails from me at 7 p.m. Because it's me on the second part of the day. Uh, but again, I'm going to stop here. There's lots of resets buttons that I use. And, and uh, Brianna, if you were planning to go to Portugal or Spain, let me know for your graduation. Amazing. Let us all know we can come with you on your dime. Yeah, thank you. But, uh, well, it's the race reset buttons. This is amazing. I think if we don't know, you know, what our warning signs are, I encourage everybody on here to truly, truly think about what does that look like for me? I'm looking in the chat. I know uh, Kristen mentioned her eye starts to twitch. Dusty and I believe Noel also mentioned just that, that morning, that early morning rising, feeling overwhelmed, learning what is that for you? Um, for me, I kind of like, I go through a panic mode and then I just shut down and I don't respond. So I may have like a couple different emails that I'm just not, my body just shuts down. I'm not ignoring people, but I'm just, I need that moment to just breathe and then I'll come back to it. And I'm with you, Anna, on the net. Um, Colette caught me when we were doing our, our uh, we have interview day, long days. And I said, well, okay, my part's over. I'm going to go take a nap. And she's like, um, well, we got, you know, she, we wanted to get that girl earlier. Um, and so I said, okay, well, I guess I'll get up and, and breathe and, and rejoin you all. But I was really cranky because I, she interrupted my hour long nap into, and only gave me like 20 minutes. So thank you for that, Colette. You're a great chair there. Um, Anyway, yeah, just really, truly thinking about that, taking a, some time and reflecting on what is it that tells me that I'm doing too much when it comes to this advocacy work, when it comes to, you know, just being a constant activist, you know, we know things aren't going to be resolved, you know, in a matter of time, but what is, what, what is going on with me and how am I dealing with it on my own? And if you don't know, then get somebody close to you. Your community even knows, like, you know, like Dusty mentioned, your family usually can tell when something's going on with you. Um, but I want to ask just real briefly, and then I do want to open this conversation up. Um, have you all utilized any resources within the university? Um, I know we do have like EAP counseling services, and you don't have to disclose that much, but just, you know, what are some things that you may have done um, within the university setting to, to get support? Um, and I'll piggyback that with briefly, what advice would you give to somebody else who maybe is feeling, you know, feeling overwhelmed or stress related to advocacy work? Loaded question on there. Okay. Uh, Brianna, why don't you jump in and tell us it? So I have not utilized any um, services or, or resources, um, but I have just found it very important to find my community. Um, I think the struggle with OSU being a predominantly white institution, we oftentimes as people of color, as Black people specifically, have to seek out our own <laughs> community, right? And so luckily I've found community with a lot of folks here um, on this call and and just being that support for my students as well. So um, my dissertation practice office is actually working with the Student Wellness Center. So um, I have learned a ton about the Student Wellness Center and I am able to, you know, give my students the support, um, the resources, learning about the Student Advocacy Center. Um, actually, one of the students that I interviewed, she was talking about a challenge that she was going through and I was able to help her through the Student Advocacy Center. So um, 
not more so for me. I, I I haven't utilized services, but learning about services that I can use and and allow other people to utilize has been um, beneficial. So I'm also a a life coach. Um, but one thing that I have had to do is say that I'm I'm taking sort of a time out, right? Setting those professional boundaries and saying. Um, I can't do everything and I don't have to do everything as, as black women, we always, we typically put on this superhero cape and, and it's okay for me to let it off and to, to put it down and to say, I'm not okay. I'm not doing well. Um, and then just the last thing is just focusing on black excellence and knowing that black people, we are inherently brilliant and amazing and talented and, and speaking positive affirmations into myself um, and, and into my tribe and making sure that I'm surrounded by people who really support me. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's always a guess with you too. Uh Desi, you wanna go? So oh, oh no, it's all ago. Nope, you go. Yeah, I'm trying to alternate. <laughs> uh I knew that question was coming. So uh it's not that I've been okay, let me go back. We we use we have several sessions on wellness at seat as like a part of a we call it professional development, but it's just coming together as a community. We had some leaders. Here in this call, I think I saw Adrian Bogus here. She's a wellness, forgot the term, like wellness coach as part of the university. So yes, I've been using those. We also have session on mindfulness that someone from uh, the university came and present to us, kind of engage with. But I, I went back and I searched for some resources today to share with the group. So I found this environmental wellness group here at Ohio State, maybe you relate with Brianna's group, and also this group on Nature Rx Ohio State. They have uh, campus resources on ideas, tips, and opportunities to get outdoors. I've never used them, okay? Just found them today, but I'm going to start engaging with them more so I kind of align what works for me with what the resources are out there. But, you know, finding the time is always... Uh, a challenge and that is a conversation for another time a whole different topic there but thank you for that i'm seeing that she dropped some information in the chat there and we seems like we need an a ocean group too people love the ocean and water and maybe they can come up with something tied into nature how about you dusty what do you uh, I think a lot of it has already been uh, stated, but one thing I didn't mention earlier is we have a couple, I have a couple different groups that are like dinner groups, et cetera, you know, that you can just go and, and laugh and, and have a good time. And I, and I think that that's important. We've talked a lot about community, uh, but you also, you know, you need community when things are down, but you also need community members who are going to be honest with you and tell you to knock it off if you're being, you know, uh, you're hanging out there too far. And so I think that that helps uh, me regroup um, uh, as well. And then as far as advice, uh, this again is just advice that works for me. I I work really hard to trust in others. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't have too many examples in life where I feel like people have been intentionally malicious. And I don't want to live in a world where I'm constantly suspicious of what other people are doing or someone's out to get me, et cetera. And so that works for me. You know, and I, again, it may not work for everybody, but I, I take everybody with the best of intentions until they prove otherwise. And, and I don't find that that's been the case. And I think we have a wonderful uh, group of colleagues here in Ed Studies, uh, and, and it's a wonderful uh, group to work with. And, and I think that helps me also just makes the day a little bit easier knowing that I, I can trust in my colleagues that they'll be there to help and they're not going to be, you know, out somehow to do something negative. I appreciate that, Dusty. Thank you. I think this, this again, this community and being in Ed Studies, I'll be honest with you all, it's it's a really warm environment. Um, there are a couple of people that I, I talk to frequently that I can kind of just shoot a text message to when I'm not feeling, you know, as well, or if I need somebody to kind of straighten me out, I'll call, you know, Dr. Ford, she'll, she'll get me together and tell me to, you know, all right, now that's enough crying, let's, let's do some work. But, um, you know, it, it's important that we have the, those communities. And if you don't have that there, I encourage you to just try to build that in, in any type of capacity, um, what that looks like for you. My advice to you all, and then I'm going to open up this floor, would be very simple. Um, people always say, I don't have the time. I don't have the time. I don't have the time to do self-care. I don't have the time to work out. I don't have the time to go to counseling. I don't have the time. You know, if you're not making time for yourself, how effective are you really being in your other circles? Um, and one thing that I have my clients, and I even do this too, is whenever I say I don't have the time, I will literally take a week of my life and I will track every hour for the four week tracking everything I'm doing. 
And I, when I say I don't have the time, I'm not counting that hour that I binge watched uh, Wednesday or something like that. You know, I, you have to think about different things that what am I doing and how am I making priority for my own wellness? And maybe that's my wellness is, is to sit and watch Wednesday, but I could have paused it and had an hour of counseling through the EAP program or, you know, maybe had um, light drinks with Dusty or a friend. You know what I mean? So you got to you have to prioritize your own self-care and your own wellness. But um Let's uh, open the door a little bit here um, with some, if we can, I'm asking with my uh, committee, I'm gonna do it anyway. Okay, yeah. any questions? <laughs> All right. questions um, or comments if anybody want from the, from the field want to share or ask of our panelists before we close out? Dr. Ford, yes. Sure, did I jump in ahead, ahead of someone? can't see this. Anybody. Go ahead. Okay. But you know what? I, I really appreciate um, the introspection and uh, sharing and just being yourself. It was really wonderful to get to know you all uh, better. I think a theme that uh, came to mind when I heard you all um, uh, make some comments is that in order to not give get overwhelmed and to not give up, then you um, one thing you I, I have to do, and I think I heard you all say this too, is is uh, focus on your sphere of influence. You know, you can't ser uh, save every black male from you know police brut brutality and dusted. I'm glad. I think it was you who said assassination. Let's just put that word out there. But anyway, you can't say we can't save all of them, but. In, from a societal level, you may not be able to, but maybe in your classrooms, P to 12, as well as, well as higher education, make connections with um, students, um, uh, Black males, and, and, you know, be a support for them in that way. So I, I my, my uh, area is, you know, working in gifted education. What can I do to make sure that minoritized students, you know, have access? I can't save all, you know, do all this other stuff. Um, then you feel like you have an impact. So I, I won't be worried. I hope that makes sense. But that's what came. That's one of the, of the many things that came to mind. Dr. Middleton, you, you're on mute. All right. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I think you're talking about just kind of centering in and focusing on a particular area, one or two. Um, any other questions or comments from anyone else? Hello, um, I do have a comment. I didn't see anyone else's raised hand. So I wanted to um, comment and thank you, Dr. Ford, for uh, pointing out sphere of influence because that's something that stood out to me. One thing I really appreciate from this panel is how your engagement uh, with social justice issues looks very different, but that does not negate the importance of self-care throughout that process, whether your engagement is through your scholarship, whether it's at a, as a director of a center um, that overviews that or in the community as well. Um, and that that not negating the importance of paying attention to um, when you need to take a step back in self-care. One thing that I did appreciate too is you are mentioning, it was like sprinkled in here, but how you are um, engage self-care as a regular practice, as well as in response to when you felt overwhelmed. And um, I just want to reiterate that importance of it being a part of your, like that more focus on wellness as it being a part of your day-to-day, -day, as opposed to only in reaction to when something happens. Um, some of the things that like stood out to me were community, both within and outside of um, your job, um, but also like your colleagues, faith, connecting with nature, hobbies, mindfulness, and getting active. Um, the university does provide a lot of resources for wellness that I had not previously taken advantage of. Um, but one thing for me that I wanted to share with folks that uh, has been really helpful is the Your Plan for Health website. Um, I attend a lot of their events. I've attended grief counseling with a group, you know, with people across the university that I didn't know. I do health coaching every month. Um, and these are just ways that I incorporate it on the regular um, that helped me during weeks like last week and this week when I'm just feeling overwhelmed with the world, but also um, with trying to change the ways I engage to be more effective. Um, so thank you for your um, authenticity and your candidacy, candidacy about um, your experience. Thank you for that, Kristen. Was there any last comment or? Okay, 
Well, I do appreciate everybody for coming in. I'm sorry, I had my oh. hand must be blended into that picture. <laughs> okay, this is gonna be real quick. I heard this from all three of you. And um, as you just said, uh, Dr. Mills, um, I see it in different ways. So, but you gotta be your authentic unapologetic self. And by the way, it's damn okay to be outraged and angry. Otherwise, I think something's wrong. Anybody who's not angry with this bull stuff going on, I think something wrong with you. Okay. But that's not what I wanted to say. Um, when I hear you all talk about <laughs> Dr. Middleton, okay, I'm, it's just going to be brief. But when I hear you all um, talking, I um, individually, so I'm not going to call your names, but I hear, you know, that you can march with your feet and that's speaking up. So that was you, Brianna, all right? As professors, we protest and we, um, it's cathartic for many of us, myself included. I get, if I'm not painting my nails, I'm getting to writing because I'm going to go out here and really hurt somebody, Donna from Cleveland, or probably get hurt trying to uh, hurt somebody. And then last one is, so march with your feet, march with your hands, right? And, this is what I'm doing right now. I'm guilty. I'm sorry. I I speak up. I am not going to shut up about the shit that's going on um, in, 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 the, in the university setting or society. So I'll stop. Mm. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. We had a lot of information in the um, we're getting today. I mean, we just need to be extended part two, part five. Uh, <laughs> please check the chat. Dr. Youth said um, $125. Oh, okay. On the quarter lifestyle. I so didn't know. we are. I'm sorry, Tanya. Um, we are at time, and I do want to respect um your all's calendars and schedules. But I just want to thank you for being here. We had a large audience, um, and I appreciate your attendance here. The diversity lecture series is every uh first Tuesday, noon to one. Our next one will be focused on um the education of Black women and girls in March. So I hope to see you there. But again, thank you for your attendance and attention today. Um, and we hope that you know in this building community as we all talked about this important that you'll become a part of our network um, and we can continue to advocate for social justice in all the ways um, that are important to us in our own spheres of influence so have yourself an amazing week on purpose um, take time for yourself if needed and we'll see you back here on zoom uh, next month